Allison, I'm going to mute everyone once they're in, so then you can just unmute. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Writer's Bridge. We have a, such an amazing mega panel today that we're excited about. We are so excited about this panel. We just have some amazing people with us. We know you guys are going to learn some amazing stuff about selling your books past launch. Uh, Karen Fine, you're here, aren't you? Karen, can you unmute and tell us when is your book coming out? Because I know your book is coming out relatively soon, isn't it? Karen Fine, who is possibly on her phone and going, Allison, I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi, Karen. No, I'm just trying to, here we go. Ah, hi. Karen, um, when, is your, when is your book coming out this summer? Uh, it's not this summer, it's not till March. Okay, then put a pin in that and I will brag about your wonderful, amazing book in probably like November, December. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> you settle on a cover? Um, yes, but I don't have permission yet. We're checking to see if they want to do like a cover launch. Fantastic. Fantastic. Fun fact, Karen was able to, her publisher asked her what kind of art she liked. And she said, I really like the cover of the number one ladies detective agency series. And so they got that artist to do Karen's cover as well, which I think is so cool. I was just blown away. Yeah. Love Yay. That. Yay. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome. We are so glad to have you here. Uh, we do always try to start on time. So we are going to go ahead and dive in. Um, this is going to be our season finale today. And we are so excited to spend this time with you and to uh, keep things going. We will be sending like some special little emails throughout the summer with some best of bridge clips and also with some special bonus stuff from Ashley and I. So do watch out for those in your inbox all summer. Today, we are going to talk about marketing after launch, and we find that a lot of book marketing advice stops at launch day, but we have with us some people who have been very successful in terms of continuing to sell their books, continuing to expand their audience, and we have a glorious and glittering mega panel here today to share with you exactly what they're doing to keep promoting after the glamorous launch day fades away. So sometimes it's a slog, sometimes you're soaring, but you're always going to be selling. And as always, you are going to leave today with at least one thing you can do right now to give your book sales a boost. Hey, Ashley, what, yes. do, what should we talk about before we dive right in? Well, I want everyone to know that the only people in the world who think a book has an expiration date are people who are in publishing. Readers do not care when it was published. It is new to them if they have not read it yet period. So we need to get that my that we need to get that deadline out of our mind. We need to get like, oh, sales numbers in the first week, the first month, whatever. I was just saying before you guys jumped on before everyone jumped on that. Um, I love snooping on book scan uh, in the database to see what is selling when and historic bestsellers, when did they actually hit the bestsellers list? Most of them, even books that sell a ton of copies, eat, pray, love, you are a badass. Two years they were out before they hit a bestsellers list. And what I say to Allison, when uh, a new book debuts on a bestsellers list, I say, Allison, the hype is coming from inside the house. <laughs> and that doesn't last. It doesn't have longevity. So what, what our guests are going to be talking about um, is how you get the book into the hands of readers and the ideas that you're talking about into the mouths of readers. So then they will whisper down the lane style, spread your message for you. So that your readers will become your evangelists. Somebody asks in the chat, how do you access BookScan? Ashley has the publisher's subscription. Um, Ashley, do you want to add anything more about that? It's $2,500 for the year. My curiosity is of great value to me. Um, and you can get it if you are a publisher or if you can convince publishers marketplace in some way that you, you, you want this and it will be helpful in your coaching to other writers or things like that. You have to sort of ask nicely to get the publisher's marketplace in to book scan. 
we also want to, before we start, remind you that uh, we also have a thing called the Express Lane. It is a membership newsletter. Every Monday and Friday, we share a short, doable platform building step in your inbox. This week, Ashley shared an easy trick for attracting audience members who will buy your book or your coaching service. And starting on Friday, I am working through a series of Friday lessons that are small steps to update and optimize your writer website. Um, Kathy Park Kelly, who's on our panel tonight, made a really nice post about us in the platform binders where she said it has really helped her build her list and start taking those little steps into marketing on a larger scale. Before we dive into our panel, we have a question of the week. So Summer has a really fantastic practice for her writing as well as a question. And some of you may have seen this on Instagram. She wrote, because of the Writer's Bridge talk about our mission as writers, I spent an hour communing with nature today to come up with my own. And now I'm feeling pretty jazzed about it. Every Monday morning, I'm gonna try to build into my writing practice, a walk through the forest to solidify my intention for the week. I plan on calling it Mission Mondays. I love this idea. Ashley, do you check in with your mission on a regular basis? Um, I do usually after I get a little burnt out and spinning and wonder why is everything so hard? It's like, oh, I'm not going for the walk at the lake with Cosmo that I take every week. Um, I take big blocks instead of taking him for a walk once a week. I go for two hours every Friday and we walk six, six and a half miles. Um, I need blocks for my brain to turn off from notification mode and get into a little bit of space that then usually by the end of that walk, I have a new idea or a new way of thinking of things. I like to take a moment. Um, it pops up every other week on my to-do list where I check in with my goals and I actually sit down with my notebook. I look at my four or five goals for the year that I usually set in January where I have both my birthday and New Year's to kind of feel like a fresh start. And I name for myself, what is the smallest step I can take this week to get a little bit closer to each of those goals? And then I put that on my to-do list and scheduled. And sometimes that step is, on hold and that's okay too. But I really like that idea of, I'm not necessarily aiming for a hundred thousand book sales this year. I'm aiming for five book sales this week. And, you know, similar things where there's a great big giant goal that I'm aspiring towards, but I want to take a tiny little step. Summer's actual question is related to scheduling posts on Instagram. And she says, I read somewhere that Instagram doesn't like those apps that post for you. And Instagram will show you less often to less people if your post is scheduled. Do you have a favorite app that is Instagram approved? Is there a best time to post? Ashley, you are the Instagram queen. What's your thoughts? I'm, I'm happy to rule over the Instagram um jurisdiction. I'm happy to represent them. Um, this is what it comes down to for me. If you make, if you take any amount of time to make a piece of content, I want as many people as possible to see it. So I'm going to, the, the time to actually post is much shorter than the time to think of the idea, work out the words, make the video, write the caption, edit the photo, blah, blah, blah. Posting is the easiest part and the quickest part, batch your content, set aside a, a time that you are going to make it, then put it in a special album on your phone saying content of the week of June 7th. Then during the week, if you think, oh, do I wanna post something? Oh, I have something. I go and post it manually to every platform. The only thing I will say about this is Meta Business Suite will allow you to post to Instagram and Facebook at the same time, and it's not an outside app. And I do find benefit from the algorithm when I use new features that platforms offer. So if you wanna play with that, I have a couple posts, two or three posts that go up every week that are scheduled through there. Um, sharing uh, old podcasts I've been on uh, because it's like evergreen content. I, I use it in those ways. Um, to just sort of check the box for promoting people who have supported me or pushing more book sales through sharing interviews. Um, but anything that's like new content that you really want to get interaction with, I would say best time in the evening on the East Coast. Now, honestly, it's going to be the effectiveness of your message and 
your hook pulling people in that's going to drive your reach and your engagement more than time of day. Um, so post it whenever you can, but then be on your phone for a few minutes to answer those first few comments to, you know, continue a conversation. Um, that's my greatest recommendation for that is remember the posting is the easy part. Do that manually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I second all that. Um, I've been more active on Twitter lately than on Instagram. I find that the best time of day for Twitter is early morning on the East coast, like seven, eight o'clock in the morning after lunch, when people are like, okay, I'd like to check my phone now before I have to go back to work. And at a time of night when the children have been put to bed and you have done your mandatory spouse time, and now you are winding down. So there you go. We hope that helps Summer and everybody else who is wondering about that. So let us introduce our first mega panel guest. Mallory McDuff is the author of Our Last Best Act, Planning for the End of Our Lives to Protect the People and Places We Love. It is such a timely and important topic. Mallory, will you tell us what is your book about and what's your post-launch marketing tip? Sure. Thanks so much, y'all. Um, my book is really, it chronicles a, my one-year journey to revise my own final wishes for my body with climate change and community in mind. Um, and that sounds like a really heavy topic, but it's my audience is honestly, besides my readers, it's my 14 and 22-year-old who are going to be the ones responsible for dealing with the logistics of death. I'm a healthy 56 year old right now, but we all are going to face death. And this looks at those decisions with the relevance of sustainability and climate and our community. So there's some levity in the sustainability because <laughs> the, the children it. bring that. Um, so, and I'm speaking to you from um, the campus of Warren Wilson College in Asheville, North Carolina, um, where I'm not just a single mom, but I teach environmental education. And my tip really comes from not having a lot of time and having a lot, like many of us, having a lot of other obligations. And it generated not as strategy, but because I am worshiping the folks who wrote blurbs for my book. I mean, I'm in love with them. And so this kind of happened naturally, cultivating long-term relationships with the authors who blurred my book, trying to see this beyond just the obligation and how did, what did that look like? What it looked like is I was naturally going in to the authors that blurbed my books and promoting their work because I was, I mean, I'm just taken with their work. And what ended up happening, I was promoting their work online. I was then promoting it, you know, just word of mouth and then posting about it. There was, I've put pictures of their books, covers, their new book covers, like out in the cow pasture in front of my house, including Allison's book, I think. Um, yes, thank you. And it, so what ended up happening is that the folks who blurbed um, my book, we ended up, I felt like becoming literary friends, literary citizens, um, you know, in the same, in the same universe. Um, they've recommended me for speaking engagements. Some of them recommended me for panels or for places to um, place essays related to my book. Not everyone had this you know, generosity or even the time, but for the folks that did, um, I, it just became a, a friendship. So cultivating those relationships with the authors who blurb your books and transforming an obligation into a win-win communication and relationship. Absolutely love that. Thank you, Mallory. I love that so much. Um, this is such a great example of Mallory demonstrating to her audience how they would love for her to support them to support her as a writer they love, right? When you say a writer I love is releasing a new book, I'm pre-ordering and I'm buying it for my indie bookstore. Immediately, we are at a special point in history where people want to make wiser, more conscious decisions. And often all they need is a demonstration of, oh, I do it like this because of, and then be like, sold. I have a new habit, right? We're, we're, we're at that threshold where it's not that hard to convince someone to change a habit if there's a good reason behind it. 
Absolutely. Um, Mallory's going to post her book link in the chat, and we are also going to share all of our book links tonight in the follow-up newsletter that you guys will all get. Or if you're watching the replay, you've got that newsletter right now. Let us turn over to Stephanie Weaver. Stephanie is one of our key community members, and she has lifted up so many Writer's Bridge authors on her podcast. She wrote the Migraine Relief Plan. She's got another book coming out this year. Stephanie, you play the long game with a lot of your marketing. Tell us about your book and tell us how your long game is working. Thanks. My, so my book's a lifestyle guide for people with migraine and recurring headaches, and it helps people determine what changes they can make to reduce their attacks. And it includes 75 anti-inflammatory recipes that are free of known migraine triggers. So I had set a Google alert uh, for migraine, the word migraine, and I noticed, uh, a, I think it was the year, no, actually, I don't even think the book was out yet. Um, I noticed a campaign that was being launched called More to Migraine that was going to be happening at um, uh, some big podcast, uh, some big bloggers can uh, blog her, which doesn't exist anymore. And so I reached out uh, through LinkedIn to find their marketing manager of the, the company. It turned out it was a, a pharma company, which is pretty common. And I started a conversation. And then over the next two years, that it was a very long, slow conversation, but I eventually was uh, invited to a paid um, focus group, which was $5,000 for two days plus travel to Philadelphia. And then that led to developing pay, being paid to develop recipes for their Facebook uh, group. And then they said, hey, we would love to send you to these Miles for Migraine run walk events. Would you be okay with us buying, say, 750 copies of your book and sending you to five events, pay all pay expenses paid, very, very nice hotels, and a $1,500 appearance fee? And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be great. Um, now, that uh, relationship, unfortunately, ended simply because once the drug comes out, they stop putting marketing money into the pre the pre drug group. Um, but it was an amazing opportunity. And I made a ton of connections within the migraine community by being at those events. And so a lot of those folks ended up um, either blurbing my book or being part of my resilient series uh, webcast. And um, so that's so my tip is like really long game long term relationships. Um, through those events. Also, I met doctors who then I followed up with. I sent them a copy. I sent them postcards for their office. So um, that's how the sales of this book, which has been out for five years now, actually led to the, the follow-up cookbook, which is coming out on July 12th. That is amazing. And that is so cool that this long game where you have been slowly building relationships and making yourself publicly known as an expert has resulted in so many book sales. And theoretically, I mean, Stephanie, do you feel like this is going to support the cookbook as well? Like that as you move forward, you're in a better place for the next book? Uh, yeah, because the I very strategically chose the people to be on my resilience series podcast who then have quotes in the book. So they all have kind of a stake in the book because their their name is actually in the book. So I did have to fight with the publisher because they wanted to cut like half of those quotes. And I was like, no, 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 oh, no, they all have to be in there. Uh, because, you know, it's the mouse for migraine chair and the retreat migraine person and the head of the so and so foundation um, and the Theraspects company husband and wife team. And so I was much more strategic this time around because I got to know the community. And so I think that's going to make a big difference. And um, people are much more inclined to buy a pretty cookbook as opposed to a lifestyle guide that's telling them what to do. <laughs> so I'm hoping the cookbook's gonna do better, but also cross sell. So all the recipes in the cookbook reference, or many of them reference, here's what you can make this with, what you can serve this with. And some of those recipes are actually in this book. So if they don't own it yet, they're gonna have to go buy it. That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Yep. I love that. Thank you, Stephanie. Again, we're talking about relationships. Stephanie takes a really business centered approach. But as you see, when you are really thinking what's in it for them, what's in it for me, you can build a relationship of reciprocity and care and consideration because you already know what would help them. 
Okay. So if we're just thinking dollars and cents, that doesn't mean that's without compassion. That means like, oh, sometimes the very best way you can support someone is by, you know, filling their pockets by sending business to them. Uh, so just remembering that. Our next guest is Kima Waterfield. Kima launched during pandemic and she's a mom with two kids. Is there one behind you or two, Kima? There we go. And not a lot of local support. So she has been doing things between nap time with um, nursing children uh, on her lap. What can you tell us about your book, Kima? And what is working for you for marketing? One of the things that really, well, first, it's Inside Passage, a nomadic coming of age story um, set in the wilds of Southeast Alaska. Um, something that I wanted to reiterate because this was important to me was I was under the impression that once your book was out for three months, it was irrelevant anymore. And I did not want to live that way because I had spent, you know, 15 years writing and releasing this book. And so um, I found that trying to emphasize social media as a way for outreach was great as far as it felt like I was reaching community and building networks with other authors and readers. Um, but I know that I'm a writer and I needed to focus on my writing strengths um, far more. So I have been working on pitching articles, um, writing freelance, not even stuff that's always related to the book, but I've had quite a few come up that were related to the book. And I recently pitched an article to Insider. Um, the editor was really kind. She wrote back and was like, thanks for sending this. I love it. This isn't quite what I'm looking for, but I just read your bio. And now I'm interested in um, possibly running an excerpt for you from your book. I'm interested in maybe another essay that's thematically linked to your story because I love the idea of this nomadic childhood of yours. And so, I mean, one year after book launch, uh, on my anniversary, I had an excerpt go up on Insider, pulled directly from the book because an editor saw my bio. It was brief, but it specifically had a great line about the book. And then it showed my clips underneath it that I've been working on since book launch. And, um, and she's also asked for this other essay that's related thematically to the book. And so my, my, um, I'm really wanting to encourage everyone to think really um, carefully about the words they use in their bio, because we know that they're a business card, but they also need to show a little of your spirit and your voice enough to like, you know, editors are paying attention. They wanna be able to see what else you have out there to offer because they're looking for ways to connect with you. You just need to give it to them. I love that idea. You want that editor to reach through that door and take your hand. You've got to make sure the door is open. Kima, that is just beautiful. I love that so much. And I think editors are like all of us. We're tired of being told what algorithms or what networks think we're going to like. We want to find a book hidden in a bio that's like, ooh, this this. I think I'm going to like this. And I think other people will too. That's fantastic. And Kima, you've published a bunch of pieces too. You also had a thing about your parents, uh, parent trapping your own parents as they were much older. And you published that in the New York times. Are you still pitching stuff? Are you still keeping going, even though your book's been out for a while? Like, yeah, book specific that's stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's how this came about. I was actually pitching um, around Roe v. Wade, um, a specific story that the editor had made a call for, and I followed that call and, you know, followed up and pursued it. But um, because, you know, I have all these other clips that are, you know, tangential to the book, and she saw the bio, she was like, I'm, I'm really interested in that. But yes, I am still pitching stuff around the book because it's not dead. Your story is not dead just because, you know, the publishing industry said, you know, <laughs> like retire that book after three to six months. Now it's time for the next one. It's just not true. Like Ashley said, uh, there's a long life for these stories. And for the reader who is seeing it for the first time, it's a brand new book. So you just have to carry it in your heart as a still new story to you and to the world. I love that. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much, Kima. That is just awesome. 
let us head over to Danielle. So Danielle Simone Brand is the high profile author of Weed Mom. Danielle, you have an incredibly specific niche. How do you reach that audience and tell us about your book? Yes, yes, I do have a very specific niche. My book is called Weed Mom. It's got a long subtitle, I won't read it. Um, and it's it's a guide to responsible use in the legal marketplace, specifically geared toward women and moms, and also a guide to the changing cultural conversations around the plant and how we can talk responsibly, productively with kids, partners, parents, all the people in our lives about this plant. Um, and because my topic is, you know, so specific and it really speaks to a community that is defined on Instagram, I will say I wrote this book more for the can of curious who were not in the community, but the community has become my biggest audience. Um, that was a bit of a surprise to me, <laughs> but because the cannabis community is fairly well defined, I was able to just start interacting with them a lot more than I had been before on social media specifically, because I had been freelancing and doing journalism about cannabis and and interviewing people but really not interacting in a community way on Instagram or, or Facebook so that's what I really started to do with this book and all of my tips really revolve around engaging with your community if it's possible I know that for my book this is you know you know more it's, it's, an, it's, it's an easier match and it isn't necessarily that way for every book but what works for me what has been working for me is interacting with big accounts on Instagram that are around cannabis and um, the big cannamom accounts um, and just making friends genuinely networking with people that I like um, so I don't just indiscriminately <laughs> <laughs> network, but, you know, I get to know people's message and, and what they're about. And if their message echoes mine or, you know, similar to mine in terms of empowerment and responsible use, then, you know, I make friends and I've gone to some in-person events once it's been available um, this last year to just solidify those relationships. And the relationships have really, really helped me. You know, some of the bigger accounts in my space talk about my book quite a lot and that's helped. Um, I also do combined book and product giveaways with people like that. It doesn't even have to be another author. It could be another cannabis author, but often it's about products, you know, CBD or, you know, some, some cannabis product that I pair with my book and, and we do giveaways. Uh, other things that have helped me are um, <clears throat> sponsoring small events in the cannabis community or just, you know, being one of the sponsors. And I've found opportunities to get my book logo and like a little mention for like 50 bucks or a hundred bucks um, in events that have a few hundred people. So you know, that's another just little grassroots way of getting getting the word out about it. Um, I also have reached out to tons and tons of podcast hosts, podcast hosts on my topic. Um, there's quite a bit of cannabis media out there. <laughs> People may or may not be aware, but basically anybody in your niche who's creating content, they need content. They need people to interview. They need new ideas. Like you're helping them too. So I would say just reach out as much as possible. Offer yourself as a resource, as um, an expert. Um, and then also speaking and networking regularly on apps like Clubhouse. Clubhouse has been really helpful for me. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but to grow my audience and to grow my book readership, speaking weekly, I, I speak at least weekly on Clubhouse and then on another app called Relevant. I have a weekly show. Um, also around cannabis and, and moms. And, you know, again, just getting off of the platforms that are just about right, communicating by writing or by one way video, you know, communication and onto the, the apps or the places where you can have a conversation with the community in more real time. I found that really helpful for just increasing the visibility of my book and my platform and, and all of it. That's fantastic. And you also do a lot with Harrow, which is a website, um, help a reporter out. How does that work? Um, I know a lot of the other people on this call are interested in Harrow. And if you are an expert in something, it can be a way to, to get into major media. Can you give us like the, the, the 20 second rundown on what Harrow is and how you get in there? Um, sure. It's, it stands for help a reporter out. Um, and I initially was using it, you know, on the journalist side, looking for sources, but you can also sign up to get emails and their digest uh, of, of 
who's looking for sources out there, who's looking for experts to interview out there. So I'm on both ends of it. Um, and so you get like either a, you know, a, a morning and an evening daily digest and you can skim through to see who's looking for what kinds of experts. And basically then you just respond, you write a short pitch email. It's helpful to have kind of a, you know, a, a basic template pitch that you have and then customize it for, for whoever is, is asking. And, um, you know, I, I find that with Harrow, just quick tip, the, the if you can provide really good information that speaks specifically to their query in that pitch, you're much more likely to be quoted or called back. Um, if you just say, hey, I'm an expert, call me, get in touch with me, delete. They will delete it because I delete all of those <laughs> when I get them. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah, they, they offer good specific information and it increases your, your likelihood. Thank you. And uh, just to make sure that we all are like on the same page on this with Harrow, you're not pitching to write a story yourself. You are offering yourself as a quotable source. So if I was a reporter and I was looking to do a story about mothers who use cannabis and are trying to figure out how to talk to their kids about drug use, I might put on the Harrow calls. I need mothers who use cannabis about how you talk to your kids. And Danielle might then send me an email that says, I'm a mother who uses cannabis. This is what I tell my kids. And I'm an expert. I'm the author of the book, Weed Mom. And then I might quote her in my story for the magazine, the newspaper, wherever. So, and Danielle, that is awesome because you are becoming such a powerhouse in your topic. You're becoming such an expert in your space. And Thank you. It's such a niche community. And they're already like heavy hitters there. But what Danielle did so well is she read the room. She was like, this is a community of people already talking about the things that are important to me and going to be important to my potential reader. How do I get in there and just figure out how to help, figure out where I fit in? Like she said, she only like really connected up with people who already she felt like she had some kinship with. Um, so it's not selling your soul. It's looking around and going, hey, who are the people I would like and who would like me? Just like, just like you're at a, like a dinner party or something, um, who I think we could have some good conversation. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you. Next up, one of, I think, the funniest parenting writers mm -hmm. online, Julie Vick. Um, she wrote the book, Babies Don't Make Small Tap. Babies don't make small talk, so why should I? An introvert's guide to surviving parenthood. So I would just like to say again, introvert, self, self-proclaimed introvert, Julie Vick is one of my favorite writers on social media. So there, there are ways that uh, introverts can really put themselves out there, put their ideas out there in a way that feels more comfortable. So Julie, tell us, you did a lot of freelance pitching like Kima has. Um, what would, and Danielle, what would you, what would you add to that? Yeah. So, um, and really quickly, I guess I'll give my quick spiel. My book is um, a humorous advice book for introverted parents focused on the early years, so like pregnancy through preschool. So great gift for the new parent in your life. Um, but yeah, my similar to Kima, um, something that I've kind of landed on is freelancing and getting um, short pieces out there. So at, like around lunch, I think like a lot of people, it's just like I did a ton of stuff. Um, I tried a lot of things, uh, said yes to a lot of things, and then it was just a lot. So going forward, it had to be something that was sustainable, I feel like. Um, so one of the questions I asked myself was like, what do I actually enjoy doing? Uh, and also, what do I already know how to do? So it's not like this huge <laughs> learning curve, um, which I did do some of, and I think you, it's good to do sometimes. But so for, for that, for me, it's like writing these short humor pieces and freelance pieces, um, essays, some service pieces. Um, and so I think, you know, I actually enjoy doing it. I sometimes get paid for it. Um, I can write, I can plug the book in a bio. And um, the other thing, you know, in the back of my mind is like future book ideas. And I think sometimes those shorter pieces can lead into that too. And it, you know, my, and it, if my identity is as a writer, then I, I want to be actually writing, you know, and getting stuff out there. So um, I think that, you know, just thinking about what you actually enjoy doing and feels like you can do longer term, especially, um, is helpful and that might be different for different people. Um, and sometimes the pieces I'm writing are not, like Kima said, they're not exactly, you know, the same. Sometimes they're more related to the book and sometimes they're less so, but I think there's still an advantage just getting yourself out there more. I and I found that um, I get, you know, social media followers or news newsletter followers sometimes too. That's awesome. I, okay, so I have a question, Julie. So when you're saying, okay, some are related to the book, some are like, you know, on a tangent, things like that. 
I want to know where you get your ideas. I want to know, do they come from pitch requests or things that bubble up inside you and say, oh, I have a new opinion on that, that I right. think would be helpful. Yeah. And I am a person who never lacks for ideas. I definitely would lack for time, but not ideas. So, um, you know, different places, I think I'm just used to like being in tune to like something happens, especially in the parenting world. Um, a lot of times it's something I'm frustrated about and I think other people would relate to it. Um, and then, you know, with humor, I feel like sometimes you can turn those frustrations into a humor piece. And I, you know, just, if I get an idea during the day, I try to put it in my phone, have a big list of my phone. And then I have a big like doc word doc <laughs> that I go through. Um, so sometimes it's just like, pulling from those ideas. And then sometimes when I see a pitch call on Twitter or something um, that relates, then obviously, you know, I can kind of plug it in. Um, and I have had sometimes, you know, as you get yourself out there more as a freelancer, I have had editors come to me and ask me to pitch them things. And so um, sometimes it's helpful when you, that happens that you have this sort of like dock of ideas ready to go that I can kind of pull from and match up to their publication. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like I get ideas everywhere and like with parenting, I feel like there's always so much going on and um, so much to potentially write about. I wanna point out one part of what Julie just said because quite often Allison and I get questions from people that say, I have this idea, but if I publish it as an essay or a blog post or a newsletter, can it go in a book because it's already published? We get a little paralyzed as writers in this, uh, the logistics, the legality of things. Listen to what Julie said. She has ideas about what people care about and her take that may be helpful, even if it's a little humorous or something to try to ease those frustrations. And she writes it. She writes it or she, you know, it sends it to an editor or she pitches it because she wants to write it. Get it out, get it out, get it out. Every time Julie talks about these things, she gets better at talking, writing about these things. And like she said, this thing then could lead to a book in that topic, but hoarding all our best writing and keeping it to ourselves um, is a certain way to, to feel like you are just talking into a void because you are. Um, it would share your writing, share it, share it, um, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Julie. Thank you. All Ashley, right. will you introduce our next person? I will. Next up, we have Cecilia Aragon. And we were just saying to um, Cecilia, we started Writer's Bridge about the same time that Flying Free came out. So we're celebrating our second anniversary birthdays together. We're birthday buddies, Writer's Bridge and Flying Free. Um, Cecilia, can you tell us about your book and um, share with us two years, two years in, what's happening with your sales trajectory? So yeah, my book came out two years ago in the middle of the pandemic. And it was really disappointing because my publisher had a tour planned for me and that got canceled. And I'm one of those people that is perhaps not as effective on social media as I am in person. My book is a, called Flying Free. It's a memoir about how I overcame fear and did something completely unexpected, which is learn to fly upside down. And this is not something that anybody would have thought I would do. But by overcoming fear, I found I was able to accomplish, it opened a lot of doors for me and I was able to accomplish many of the things I'd always dreamed about, but never really took those first steps to do it. So, um, my tip is about, you know, not giving up. So my book has been out for two years and it did decently. It sold about 10,000 copies the first year. Um, but I'm finding that sales are only accelerating now and, I'm, and more people are wanting to buy the book and, and are interested in the book. And, I, and it's, it's because I think that finally I'm getting out in person and speaking about the book. And I find that I am encountering new audiences who love to hear me talk 
And whenever I give a talk, I, I sell out of all the books that I have, and which is why I made this, here's my other tip. I made a, um, um, one of these, uh, I, what is it called? QR, yeah, code. QR code. A QR code, yeah. And so when I run out of books to sell, which I do at every talk, I just hold this up and then people can buy it. They can hold up their phones and buy it directly. And this is very effective as well, too. Cecilia, um, where did you make that QR code? Like was if we just Google make your own QR code, a website will pop up and we'll be able to do it probably for free. Yes. Google free QR code. And there are many sites and you can find the ones that don't require you to put in your email address because I don't want to get on another mailing list. I'm on too many of those. Um, and uh, so for me, what, what, what really works is just is the word of mouth. You know, I've heard there are a lot of books that do become bestsellers long after their launch because people, because people um, recommend it. And this is what I'm finding. And so I wrote my book for non-pilots, for anybody who's really interested in overcoming fear and, and you know, changing their life. Really, that sounds cliched, but that really is what it's about and about hope in the middle of darkness. And um, what I find is that, um, is that uh, I have discovered new audiences. So, I wrote it for you know, young women who were discouraged or who felt they were fearful, they weren't doing what they really wanted to do. But I find that I'm, I'm giving talks and older men will come up to me and say, your book really resonates with me because I was discouraged as a child and this is what I'm doing now. And um, then they buy it as gifts for their, they buy several copies as gifts for their nieces or daughters you know, or friends. And um, it's kind of snowballing, um, you know. So I used to really worry about reviews on Amazon. And I was like, oh. every day I would wonder why am I not getting any more reviews? But lately it seems like I op when I check the, the site, which I don't do as much anymore, there are more, there are more um, reviews and more books sold. And Oh, the one other thing that I did want to say, the other tip is never give up on a book because Flying Free is actually my second book. And my first one, um, Writers in the Secret Garden was about fan fiction and it didn't do very well, but somebody read it and loved it and invited me to give a TED talk, which now has one mil over 1 million views. So, don't give up on your older books, keep getting the word out and be enthusiastic. Don't ever, and be honest. That's the other thing too, you know, like I love what Allison and Ashley do, but I could never do the sorts of social media promotion Ashley is so good at. That's just, that's not me. So I do what, what I'm good at and I don't beat myself up that I'm not as good as these other things. I do what I'm good at and it works. That is absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love that. And what a great story too about your past book coming back out again. And I love that because that's the nice thing, folks. Once we have written a book, the hard part is really pretty much done. Now it is a product that is sitting in our back pocket and that we can pull out there and sell it to people when the time is right. So that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Sana Fayez is the author of Chai Chats, Personal Essays to Fill Your Cup. And Sana, you found that you were able to connect with readers at events that were not necessarily book-oriented events. Tell us about your book and tell us what you've been doing. And I freaking love how your hijab harmonizes with the cover of your book. I know you chose that on purpose and it looks awesome. Thank you so much, Allison. So my book, it's about the art of slowing down in life to honor and celebrate not only moments, but also yourself. And these personal essays are in three sections. It goes along with the recipe of making a chai. So the first section is about gathering your inner resources. The second section is about boiling in the heat of challenges. And the third part is about savoring that chai, like celebrating moments in your life. 
Um, so I found out that uh, whenever my tip is, whenever you go out there, just introduce yourself as author of your book. Uh, being an introvert and also like being a first time author, I have massive imposter syndrome. So um, whenever I went out to like pick up my kids, I would introduce myself, I'm an author of Chai Chats. Whenever I went to a retreat, I introduced myself, author of Chai Chats. And I went to one retreat where there was a woman who was having a leadership summit for women. And she said, I would love to have you and um, at this event and sell your books at this vendor table. And I said, okay, that's great. I said, yes. And they also have a, a social media presence. So they also, um, you know, I got some exposure there and the event happened this weekend and I was able to sell a lot of books there. So basically I, I don't have a strong social media presence and I know that um, I shine in one-to-one -one conversations. So being at that author's table and just talking to per people one-on-one -on -one, that really helped. And also I was able to reach out to an artist on Instagram and create recipe cards for my book and I also got exp exposure through there. So just basically my tip is just go out there and introduce yourself as author of you know, your book and that'll open doors for you and just keep saying yes. That is absolutely fantastic. And I love that idea about sharing your work in all places, not just places where people are expecting to hear about you in your book, but also places that you're moving in your daily life where people know who you are and they get to find out this cool extra thing about you. Thank you, Sana. That's wonderful. Absolutely love, love it. And I can't wait to read that book. I know. Love it so much. That structure and the, the sections. I was like, please, please. Just I love when people we we can we all have events that happened, right? We can all recount that to people. But when people weave that cleverly, it's one of my favorite things. It really blows my hair back. So love that, Santa. Thank you. Kathy Park Kelly's book deals with domestic abuse, not necessarily the most cheerful subject to talk about on social media, but a lot of Kathy's marketing ties into her subject. So Kathy Park Kelly, will you share with us what is your book and tell us what it is you do? Sure. Hi, everyone. And hi to the five South African writers on the webinar. It's really nice to see them. So my book is Boiling a Frog Slowly, a memoir of love gone wrong. And it just tells the story of my, it's a, so it's a memoir, and it's a story of my eight-year relationship, which had domestic violence, and how I got out of it, and how I managed to thrive. Uh, so, so obviously the topic is gender-based violence, and so what I did uh, for my first book launch, because I knew most of the people who were coming had already bought books, because I'm lucky enough to have a very supportive community, um, and I wanted to make book sales at the launch, so I had a donation box and invited people who'd already bought a copy, to buy an extra copy and then throw it into the donation box. And then I, set, uh, I sort of committed to sharing those copies with uh, NGOs. In South Africa, gender-based violence is a big thing. And so there are many NGOs that deal with that. And so that was the start of the donations. And now once a week, I do a social media post. Um, uh, it's a donation day where I tag the NGO and I either go and meet them. So we have a photograph together or I tag them and show me packaging up the book and send it to all the different NGOs and it's getting a lot of in engagement and I find that after each weekly donation post I'll get a little spike in people saying I'd like to buy a copy for donation so my de donation box hasn't emptied at all it just keeps kind of regenerating itself um, and that's it thank you that's fantastic thank you Kathy and that invitation, that invitation to buy an extra copy, brilliant, brilliant, right? Like I said, people are looking for opportunities to be of service. And when you say, here's an easy way to be a good human, they're like, thank you. Check, checked my box today for trying to be a good person. I love that so much. So clever, Kathy. Allison Lane is a fantastic contributor to our chat every week. She's a fantastic contributor to the platform binders, and she is the creator of Buzzworthy Lab. Allison, you have a really counterintuitive interview strategy. Will you tell us what it is? You're muted, Allison, but I can't wait for people to hear the strategy. When I read it, I was like, whoa, I don't do that. And I'm going to start. Unmute myself. Now you are. All right. <clears throat> well, listen, um, I'm Allison Lane. Yes, I'm, I'm a publishing and promotion Sherpa. And um, this is coming from a 25 year 
marketer and publicist. Okay, I used to run uh, PR and marketing for Unilever and Burt's Bees and the Body Shop. And so I'm telling you that this is the biggest tip. The interview is no place for original thought, which means Ashley did not ad lib how to keep monogamy hot. That was not that she prepared that. And Allison did not just toss out her social ha handle gorilla editor or her email unkind editor. No, you have to create your mic drop moments, which means you have to pitch, you have to place and you have to practice. Um, meaning you have to prepare for your end goal, which is to be quoted and to give a video clip to whoever is interview you, interviewing you, usually on Zoom or a news clip or a social tile. So you want to give them the quote that you know is going to end up being promoted. It needs to be thought provoking or provocative, which I really like. Um, insightful or surprising, and that you can say in one breath, because otherwise people interrupt you. And here's how you get a call out quote. Every question can end with your mic drop moment. You could, you know, they could be asking, how do you write the personal stuff, Ashley? Or is the sky blue, Ashley? And here's how you answer. A lot of people ask that because what they really want to know is, and then you rephrase the question that you want to answer. What they really want to know is, how can I keep my marriage steamy? Oh, yeah, that's true. Here's what I can share. And then you take a breath because they're paying attention. And so your quote can be edited. This is your pause. You, you say, here's what I can share. And then you say your shit. You say it. You must be your best marketer. Marketers nail the present and they prep for their next steps. So, oh, and you have to prep for that end question, which is anything else to add? Yes, is the answer to that question. Yes. And then you give your most important stickiest tip. A sticky tip is something that I have to go and get in order to stay, to get the, the real like nugget, whether it's your freebie, your download, uh, the, uh, the invitation to your free workshop coming up. So I'm gonna give you a sticky tip right now. You can get my where to pitch cheat sheet, 70 some media outlets that are already hungry for your words and your message. I'm going to put it in the chat and you can meet me on everything social at Allison Lane Lit. Beautiful. I love how you are acting out for us exactly how it is supposed to go. Um, I will say I have done many, many interviews over many, many years, and it really helps to have fun, snappy answers to the questions that you know you're going to get asked a lot. Uh, it, it is just so helpful, and you can practice those in the mirror, or you can practice them out loud in your car so that they just slide right off your tongue and you have them ready to just slip right into the interview. Exactly. Trish McDonald wrote, thank you so much, Allison. Trish McDonald wrote her novel Paper Bags as auto fiction. And Trish and I actually share a publisher, Woodhall Press. Trish, we, Ashley and I often say that it is rare that social media itself sells books. For most people, social media is an amplifier. Social media is a way to get their message out there more often. You took a negative message and you made it positive. So tell us about your book and tell us what happened with your tweet. Well, this is my book, Paper Bags. And I know everyone wants to know What's going on on that cover? Well, I don't let everybody know about this, but I'm gonna tell you that's the red lace lingerie coming out of the paper bag. So it's a secret. The story is about a secret and it's a perfectionist woman who's been married for 34 years, leaves the marriage and ends up uh, chasing after a rambling man. 
So not, nothing too exciting about that. However, he has a pension for red lace panties. So the story is how this perfectionist rule following woman figures out how she can find love in a safe place. That's what she's looking for. So I, I'm, querying, I'm querying my book and the agent says, don't you know that everything has an expiration date? And I'm like, oh my God, he thinks I'm expiring. Like he, maybe he knows how old I am. I'm beside myself and I immediately turn it around and I say, that's right. And my marketing plan is there's no expiration on a dream. I make that tweet and someone that I know from a, from a, from a book group, from a writer's group is a renowned screenwriter. She picks it up. Not only does she retweet it, she quote tweets and tells all of her followers, 20,000 strong, that they need to pay attention. She DMs me. I don't even know anything about DMing. I go to my message. She said, you better check your Amazon right away. My Amazon went from number 55 to number one in an afternoon. In an afternoon. I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. And it, it was number one in the LGBTQ uh, category in an afternoon. So I'm all about Twitter. You've got a story? Yeah, Twitter's, Twitter's the way to go for me. I love that. And I love that you had established yourself enough on Twitter at that point where you had enough people who were paying attention to amplify it for you. That is absolutely fantastic. Thank so thank you so much, Trish. Thank we you. are going to dive for about four minutes into our breakout rooms. Um, they are never as weird as you think they're going to be, and they are always fun to connect with other writers. When we come back from breakout rooms, we are going to give you the three top tips that you can do today to sell your book after launch. And we recommend that if you're in a breakout room, and you don't have to be, but if you're in a breakout room, what can you use from today? How are you going to use it? Um, and I'm just popping people who got left behind into breakout rooms. What great advice that. today. And mm -hmm. like, you know, there are some, there are some concepts that like kind of run underneath them, but the variety in what people chose to do and really that message over and over, like what is fun for me? What is easy? What plays to my strengths? What's enjoyable? Um, really remembering that we don't have to do it all. And if we do the things that we're best at, we're probably gonna get the most bang for our buck. I think that's absolutely a great way to look at it because it's not fun to do stuff that you don't enjoy. I'm just gonna check through and make sure nobody is left by themselves. And I don't know, I don't know if people here uh, in the main room right now or people watching the recording have ever read um, Now Discover Your Strengths. Um, it's like Clifton Strengths Finder. I think it was like bought by Gallup. Maybe you can you can take the quiz online or buy the book. But I, I really like the first half of the book is explaining what why we should give a shit about our strengths. And it's remarking that so many of us have been taught that um, to become more efficient or more well-rounded or better liked or anything that we really need to look at where we're weak, like to you know shore ourselves up all all the way around. And in the book, they're saying. Um, the things that we're naturally bad at, you're always going to kind of suck at. So like, what if Tiger Woods was like, you know, golf is easy, but I would be more well-rounded if I studied the piano. Okay. Like let yourself be good at what you're good at. And for a lot of us, it's like hard to see, but when, when we have um, a little bit of insight or we have support to dive into that, we can realize that, oh yeah, the things that we are good at, spend the time there, um, get other people to help with the things you're not good at. Or one of the recommendations in the book is just stop doing it. If there's something that's like such a slog, stop doing it and see if anybody notices. Because in some cases, no, 
no, it's actually not something that you need to do. It's something that you think you should do because insert reason here. Um, so now discover your strengths, really, really good book. And I had my team do the assessment and I can see why people are good at what they're good at and where they're good at things that, Hey, Suzanne, um, that I'm not for me, almost all my strengths are in the analytical thought. I love ideas. I love ideas. I love ideas. Um, which Allison knows, which anybody, you know, always trying new things because that's what excites me. Um, my, my VA Lauren execution is where all her strengths are. <laughs> so finding that out, you can, you can take yourself off the hook and give some energy to the areas where you're really good. I really support that. There are, are so many things actually that I have decided in the past five or six years, you know what? I am not going to do that. I don't think it's going to make a difference to anybody. I am releasing myself from that particular obligation. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's more formal where it's like, you know, my husband and I have divided cleaning based on who enjoys doing what. And I will just say, I have not cleaned a toilet since I moved in. And that is one of the best things about my marriage. Um, but even if, uh, even if, uh, he did not want to do it, I would hire the housekeeper more often uh, because it's just, it's not the best use of my time to spend that time. Whereas Ashley, you have pressed your children into service. I have, I have nothing makes me prouder than child labor. And um, interesting too, during pandemic, Manny, my Greek husband who like must've learned to cook and clean through osmosis because like a Greek boy, the sisters make the bed for the brothers, like in all his cousins' houses. And like my head almost exploded. Okay, so that's how we grew up. He has found that he has seen his mother like fussed over people at meals and I am just not an adequate fusser. So like he makes all the meals for us. He asks, did this kid eat? Did that kid eat? Did you eat? Um, I just let him fuss over all of us and, and, and do that um, because there was this tension when I would try to do it. And then I'd be like, oh, he doesn't think I'm giving the kids enough options or what is, what is this person over my shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> that just really deciding where, where your strengths and your personalities fit best is so liberating. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I genuinely enjoy cooking. So I do most of the meals at our house, which is nice. Although my husband does breakfast, which is really lovely. He gets up before me. So he does breakfast, which I think is just delightful. And then they uh, sit down and they do these cryptic crossword puzzles that make me think <laughs> Allison is a goddamn genius. Thank you know, you. <laughs> she really likes these hard ones. We, there's so much fun though. I love cryptic crosswords. They make me so happy. Plus I do the regular crosswords so fast that it's not fun to do them with another person. Whereas with the cryptics that actually takes like conversation and we talk about it. And because we're doing British cryptics, like I'm already automatically a little bit handicapped because I spell some of the words differently and I don't know all the cultural references. So it works out really, really well. Cause then he's like extra smart on quite a bit of the stuff. And I like struggling to catch up, which is good. So, yay. Welcome back from breakout rooms. Welcome back. We are so glad everybody is back. We want to give you our very top tips uh, from what you can do today, uh, what you can walk out of this meeting tonight and go forth and do about your book or building your platform. Before we do that, we want to remind you, this is our season finale, but because you're on the list, and that's true whether you're watching this live with us or whether you're watching the replay, you will be hearing from us occasionally all summer long with pop-up tips and best of bridge clips. If you need more Allison and Ashley, we invite you to join us on the express lane. If you're on the fence, we're going to be sending a special sampler email next week that's going to show you what Express Lane is all about and give you a two sample lessons there. Absolutely free. Um, uh, we also want to remind you that Express Lane members get access to the complete Writer's Bridge episode archive too. So three things you can do today. I would say, number one, think about Allison Lane's interview tips and think about what are three things that are really key to know about you, about your work, about your book. Come up with a clever way to deliver those things and strategize how you're going to deliver those answers in every possible capacity. Ashley? I would say let's 
develop and maintain a reader centric focus for our books. Our book is new to every reader who picks it up for the first time, whether they got a dusty copy from a library or picked it out of a little free library um, in their neighborhood. So to have our bios on our socials, remind people of our book to allow ourselves to be easily found to show up regularly on socials even if it's just in your stories or something so that um the reader knows oh this person's active and if i'm interested in this and wanted to reach out or just wanted to follow or get more it's right there for me and i also want to add keep cultivating relationships Today is a great day to email that workshop teacher you really liked, that leading expert in your field you briefly met. Congratulate them on something they've done. That's a great reason to reach out. They have probably done something recently. You can Google them. You can stalk on their socials. Send them a little personal direct message or a little personal email that congratulates them for what they've accomplished because that way you're putting yourself back onto their radar as well. So that later on, when you need that connection, you will have spent time building your relationship with them before you needed anything from them. When Ashley and I first created the Writer's Bridge, we had no idea that we would keep doing this for two years. We are so grateful to hold this space for you and you honor us with your time and attention. You honor us, you honor our teachers and you honor our teachers' teachers. Writing a book can feel very lonely and marketing can feel like slogging through the snow uphill in both directions, but you are here to support each other and we are here to support you. So keep building bridges to your audience and have a wonderful summer. Feel free to unmute yourselves for a happy goodbye. Thank you thank so you, much. Allison. Thank you, Allison. Thank, thank you, so much. Thank thank you, you are welcome. Welcome. Thank you, thank you everybody. Awesome. Enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you in August. Bye.